This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. Science is discovering that mental attitude is vitally important to the living of daily life. The famous French psychiatrist Paul Lemays found in his studies of European husbands that men who whistle while they work rarely get divorced. A German scientist says the smile is mankind's most important signal of friendship, the only greeting gesture with no clear counterpart in the animal kingdom. A San Francisco heart specialist has discovered that, strangely, sheer boredom can be more exhausting than hard physical activity. Again, an issue of attitude. Yet the sources of human purposefulness and joy lie within the human mind and soul. The psychologist Dr. Ralton James has written, Laughter is something few psychologists have ever taken seriously, yet it has been estimated that smiling and laughing occur ten times more frequently than all other human emotional reactions together. One reason for this scientific neglect is that humor, like love, tends to elude scientific probing. And he concludes by saying the truth is that nobody can say exactly why human beings laugh. End of quote. Consider that. Are you going to refuse to laugh anymore simply because some scientist declares that science cannot explain laughter? Or would you wisely reject religion because science cannot explain that? Some realities of human experience are not known by intellect alone, but are known spiritually, are known by faith. But to say, have faith, is not to imply that one must stop using his or her mind. It is rather to say, use more than your mind. If I say, look at the sunset, I'm not saying you should simultaneously stick your fingers in your ears and stop using your ears in order to use your eyes. I'm saying use more than your ears, use your eyes as well. So to say, have faith, is to say, use more than your mind. Utilize your soul. Transact with the spiritual domain of your life. The kingdom of God, declared the master, is within you. Real religion begins in faith, and it ends in experience. You may begin with the faith that you are loved by God. But the momentous moment will come when you become as certain of it as you are certain of your own existence, of the sky overhead and the earth at your feet. Some mistakenly confuse extreme and egotistical self-confidence with faith. Assuming that the man who is brazenly conceited who never admits he might be wrong, must have a great sense of faith. That is a misunderstanding. Faith is not working crossword puzzles in pen and ink. It is not the egocentric assumption that you cannot make mistakes. It is not so much total self-confidence as it is total God-confidence. Faith is striving to become perfect. It is not assuming that you are in advance. It is living truth. It does not pretend to be infallible, it is humble. But faith is an ever-available inward resource. It's when you walk over to the automatic coffee vending machine, drop in your last quarter, push the button, and a five-second stream of coffee comes out and goes straight down the drain, and only afterward the plastic cup plops into place, but by then there's no more liquid coming out. It's at a time like that you need religion. It requires all the religion you have to keep from trying to disassemble the vending machine with your foot. Religion can inculcate a profound sense of self-control over your life, your emotions, your actions and reactions. But that is only one of many things it can accomplish. There is an entire spectrum of power in faith. Faith lies beyond intellect, yet it is not anti-intellectual. It is not unreasonable. It transcends reason. Logic is not infallible. Suppose an elderly man got a pain in his left leg, went to the doctor. Doctor told him it was old age. Logically, his right leg is just as old as his left leg, so why doesn't it hurt too? Logic cannot comprehend all of reality. It takes no account of personality, uniqueness, your individual differences, emotions, motivations, spiritual cravings. Man is more than a conscious computer. Man is a son of the everlasting God, indwelt by a fragment of the divine, and to discover, to explore these inward resources and begin to live as you were born to live, as you were created to live, as it feels right to live, not just knowing about God, but knowing God can totally transform your life. In the last analysis, spiritual truth is to be sought 
wherever you can discover it. One of our close friends at the university has been a Hindu girl from India, taking her doctor's degree in endocrinology. Had many lively, fascinating religious discussions with some of her Indian friends as well. One of the most interesting things she told me was of an old yogi back in India who never said a single word to his students, but who did things to make all his points. His religious teaching was done entirely in actions, never in sermons. She said, for example, that one of the things he would do was to find a large, heavy stone and laboriously begin to roll it up a nearby hill or incline with great effort. Soon most of the village would be gathered about him, watching him sweat and strain to roll that rock uphill, wondering why he was doing it. As soon as he'd reached the top of the slope, however, he would immediately let go of the rock and let it roll back downhill, whereupon he would go down and begin to roll it back up again. That was his method of teaching. I was told that almost everyone in the crowd was clearly and vividly able to perceive the point of what he was doing. He was illustrating that spiritual development is difficult to attain, that a person has to work with strenuous dedication to achieve it, and that it is a demanding struggle, but that if a person stopped progressing, if he stopped praying or worshiping or developing spiritually, he could easily, quickly roll back downhill again. That spiritual development is never static, but always moving, either progressing or retrogressing. Another thing this old yogi did once was to make gentle good fun of a certain man in the village who prayed to all the Hindu gods he possibly could he would go about from shrine to shrine, temple to temple, and give little prayers to as many of the gods as he was able in hopes of not getting any of them angry at him and getting as much from each one of the gods as he possibly could. One day this old yoga teacher followed this villager around and kept digging small shallow holes everywhere the villager went, scores and dozens of little holes he dug in the ground. Again, those who gathered and watched were mystified at the spiritual significance of what the old yogi was doing until someone in the crowd pointed out that if the old wise man had not dug many scattered shallow holes and had dug one large deep hole instead he would by then have struck water and that was the meaning of it that instead of a shallow scattering of religious efforts a person must concentrate his or her desires and longings on one single thing. Jesus of Nazareth declared that as well. He said, a man's eye must be single, that his priority should be in order. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all other things will be added to you. Let this be the first aspiration of life. One hasn't forever to make that decision. According to the most recently compiled statistics, if you're a woman, 38 and a half years old, you have on the average precisely that long yet to live, another 38 and a half years. For the typical man, the figures are that if you're 35 and a half years old, your lifetime is statistically half over. The question is, however much or little of your life you may have lived, what are you doing with it? Have you discovered a purpose worthy of your time and your energies? God has a will for your life. If you will seek it, you can and will discover it. But if you don't, you won't. This is true of anything. People lament they haven't a purpose in life. Frequently, those are the same people who've never spent any time questing, really searching for a purpose in life. Absurd. If a button comes off your overcoat in the movie theater, you're not going to find it unless you seek for it. What makes you think you'll find your purpose in being alive unless you seek for it? Declared the master, seek and you will find. That is an unconditional statement. There are no ifs, buts, maybes, perhapses, possiblies, or probablys in that. It's a flat, bold, bald, unvarnished, undiluted, unpolluted truth. If you want to find the will of God, if you want that, above all other things, you will. Why, then, do so few feel such a transcendent purpose in their lives? Because so few have really sought such a transcendent purpose for their lives. God knows who you are, where you came from, and where you could be going, what you could be doing with your life, but the decision to go there, to do that, is yours. Many an elderly man has regret in his eyes 
because never once during that man's lifetime was the decision really made and followed to devote himself to the highest of purposes. Be true to the best you know. Far better to wear out than to rust out. The joy of life is found not in seeking the joy of life, but in seeking spiritual values, truth and beauty and goodness. Living in love for God and for people. The problem is, millions of people want to feel different, but do not particularly want to be different. Yet, really, to feel different, you have to become different. You have to be transformed. People may judge spiritual truth by whether or not it makes the hair on the backs of their necks stand up. You can rake your fingernails across the blackboard and accomplish that. It's not just how you feel. The teachings of Jesus are not merely concerned with helping you to feel different, but to be different. The happiness of real religion is more than a glandular giddiness, an electrochemical convulsion, a psychological feeling. It is a joy of soul and an exuberance of spirit. It is a joy born of forgetting about yourself. He who loses himself, declared the Master, will find himself. It is a joy born of loving God and loving people so intensely that you forget your own spiritual hypochondria and learn that the way of love and service is the way of joy. If you're interested above all else in yourself, there is no way you ever are going to be happy. But if you learn to forget yourself and your love of God and your love for people, you will discover that in this lies joy. It's the same paradox encountered in piloting a jet from continent to continent or charting the course of a ship across the ocean. Map makers have long since learned that due to the curvature of the earth, the shortest, most direct way across the ocean is not to draw a straight line on one's map, but a carefully plotted arc. A ship sailing from San Francisco to Japan does not map its course straight for Japan, but plots a route which on a flat map at first appears to be heading somewhere else than toward the port of destination. So likewise, the most direct manner in which happiness may be achieved is not by the questing of happiness but rather by spiritual commitment to God love of God and love of people in this lies genuine joy then arise each morning with the praise of God on your lips with thanks on your lips for another day and glad in your soul to meet a new sunrise or if you get up after the sun has risen arise with gladness to greet the ringing of the clock but rejoice in this endless boundless presence of God, the God who loves you infinitely, whose son or daughter you are, and whose spirit indwells your mind this moment. If you're interested in these topics, write to us. We want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviated SRI. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address. SRI, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, What Does Happen When You Die? If you're interested in these topics, no cost, no charge, no obligation. Nobody's going to come to your door with an attache case and try to sell you something. Simply write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute Box, 3080 Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, May God's will be done by you. Good day.